Can everybody say amen? Isn't that fun to praise God? Wow. Wow. You know, Carolyn and I have had this conversation throughout this weekend, uh, just talking about being sheltered in the arms of God. God being our refuge and God being our fortress and God being our strength. And uh, it was kind of interesting, uh, a family that had been close to Carolyn and I uh, through the years that we pastored at Spirit of Life uh, Christian Church. Uh, the husband had passed away about five years ago, and Friday morning uh, his wife had passed away. And, and uh, I, I got a call the day before, and they said, Mom's not doing good. We're going to put her under hospice care. And so I was making plans to go see uh, the family on Friday morning when I got the call that she had already passed away. And as I went to visit with the family, uh, they handed me a slip of paper, and I, I thought it was interesting. And before she had, had passed away, she had written on a piece of paper, and she said, I want these three songs sang at my funeral. And, uh, and then she put on the note that she was writing out, this is my story. This is my life. Through it all was the first song, <laughs> and ending up in the shel sheltered in the arms of God. Isn't that pretty heavy? Shel she knew where she was going. She knew what she was encountering. She believed it through her whole life, through it all, it was because of him. And yet she knew she was coming down to the end that I'll be sheltered in the arms of God. Isn't that pretty? That's quite a testimony, I thought. And I'd have told you the middle song, but I forgot it. <laughs> oh, without him, okay. Thank you, Carolyn. The middle song was without him. So I thought that was pretty neat. Well, we're getting ready to do communion. And you know, communion is a pretty neat encounter for you and I because we do this in remembrance of all that he's done in our lives. We do this in remembrance of what he done 2,000 years ago that he came into this world to love us. He came into this world to save us. He came into this world to give us a gift of eternal life. Isn't that pretty neat? And yet also, we do this in remembrance that we have forgiveness of sin. And so when we do communion, I think it's neat that we can break the bread and be re in remembrance that his body was broken, that ours would be made whole. I think it's neat that when we take of the cup, that it reminds us that his blood was shed on the cross of Calvary and that we have forgiveness of sin. So I want to share this scripture with you, and then we're going to pray together, and we're going to allow God to speak to our hearts and touch our lives as we share communion together. Reading in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, starting with verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. If you guys will come, we'll uh, pray over the bread and, and Elmer and, I, yeah, and Charlie, and we'll pray over the Let's join together in prayer as we pray over the bread. You know, as you pray, ask God to touch your heart. Ask God to work powerfully through his grace in your life. Father, we come before your presence. Thank you that we can be in remembrance of how much you love us, of how much you sacrificed, of your willingness to give of your life that we might find life in Christ. As we receive the bread this morning, refresh us, strengthen us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Touch our lives, and may we offer our thanksgiving to you for all that you've done for us. And we ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the air, this is the air, your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread, this is my daily bread, your very word. Spoken to me, and I, I'm desperate, and I, I lost without you. Let's receive the bread in remembrance of our loving Savior. Let's join together in prayer as we pray over the cup. Charlie, would you lead us, please? Bread. Amen. Thank you, Charlie. This is my bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word. 
spoken to me and I I'm desperate for you and I I'm lost without you this is the air this is the air I breathe Let's receive the cup this morning in remembrance of our loving Savior and the forgiveness that we receive. Can everybody say amen to that? Praise God. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. I'll pray. You, 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 I'll pray, Charlie. Okay. okay, Father, thank you for the privilege of worship. Thank you for the privilege of serving you. And even as we give of our tithes and offerings, may you bless it. May you multiply it. and May you give back to the givers. In your abundance, in Jesus' name, amen. Make me a blessing. Make me more like you. Make me a blessing. Teach me to love like you. A heart with love for others. Make me more like you. Make me me a blessing make me more like you Jesus make me a blessing teach me to love like you a heart with love for others make me more like you As I share with you in the next few moments, I've been preaching about Pentecost. Actually, this will be the kind of conclusion of, uh, of the messages about Pentecost. Uh, but I want you to encounter some things that preferably God will touch your heart about. I titled this message, Things That the Spirit-Filled Church Will Encounter in the Year 2015. Things That We Should Encounter As We Go Through the Year 2015. Uh, as I share with you, I, I want you to allow God to open your heart. Here's a question that I ask myself every once in a while. I've asked this question probably periodically as I preached here at, at the church. But I like to ask this question because it causes me to begin to dream a little bit. It causes me to begin to uh, uh, think, could God do this? Could God open the windows of heaven and literally touch us in such a way that, that we uh, would stand in amazement? So let me ask you this question. I, I, I ask myself this. What would the church be like if we started from scratch and followed the scriptural pattern of the book of Acts? What would the church be like if we just decided, say, wait a minute, everything we've done, maybe we need to, to put it off to the side and come back and say, is there a biblical pattern to follow in the book of Acts? And should we do that? What would happen in our lives? What would happen in our communities? What would happen uh, in the surrounding area? What would the church be like? How would it, you know, how would it be? You know, uh, would God open the windows of heaven? And would he pour out his spirit as he did on the 120 in the upper room? Would multitudes be saved? Would lives be changed in a more dramatic way than we've ever seen? So I want you to ponder that as I share with you. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Acts, the second chapter. And uh, this read uh, portion, starting with verse 17, and we're going to read through 21 uh, uh, about the day of Pentecost. And so Acts 2.17 starts, it says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And in those days I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark. The moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arise. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that powerful? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, when I read the history of the first church in the book of Acts, I feel like we're missing something. 
I feel like we're missing uh, uh, the power of God, the, the moving of God's spirit in our lives. And I, I want you to think about that. And what it does to me, it creates an expectation in me. It creates an excitement in me to think there's more to come. There's more to experience. There's more to encounter in our lives. So I, I want you to think uh, along those lines. You see, I want to stir some excitement in you. I want to increase some expectation, some wonder uh, uh, in our lives. And we're going to talk about the word wonder a lot this morning because it's amazing to me when you read in the Scriptures, especially going through the book of Acts, the word wonder uh, appears several different times. That there was wonder happening. People were wondering what's going to happen next. And, and uh People gathered with an excitement and an expectation of saying, wow, God is alive in us, you know, and he's doing great and mighty things. So uh, I want you to think about that because to me, it says in these last days, and, and, and me and Carolyn had this discussion, so I'm going to extend it to you, okay? It says in these last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, okay? I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And so here's the discussion that Carolyn and I had. I believe that God wants to take men and women, people of God, and begin to pour out of their lives into the surrounding area where we live, that it would have such an impact on people. People would do one of two things. They would either be drawn to it or they'd run from it. And I want you to think about it. That means you and I, that as we live in the year 2015, God may want to wake you up, begin to, to pour out of you his supernatural power of his spirit because that's what happened in the early church of, uh, of Acts. They went from house to house breaking bread and praising God and having favor with all people, and God was adding daily to the church so you should be saved. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? But what God was doing, he was pouring out of his spirit out of the people's lives. Now, here's my passage of scripture for that. John 7, 37 through 39 says, if Anybody thirst? Well, you see, I want to stir up some thirst. I, I want to stir up some appetite in you that you'll want to thirst. He says, if anybody thirsts, let him come and drink. And he says, this is my paraphrase. Oh, yeah, Larry's got it up. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out and says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And can you go to the day? And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, out of his inner being will flow rivers of living water. Can you imagine that? And that's what he's talking about in Acts 7. He says, out of my spirit I will pour. Out of the people's lives I will pour out my spirit and it will have such an impact that it will begin to shake the community for the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? And so he says, if you're thirsty in the year 2015, if you're really thirsty, if you want to encounter God, you can come and drink. And he says, I will begin to pour out of your own inner being living water. And that living water will have such an impact as it did in the book of Acts. You'll never be the same and the community will never be the same. You see, in America, almost in any given town in America, you'll find numerous churches. Churches ring their bells on Sunday morning. We tore our church down so we don't have a bell to ring. And Larry rings it for us on the CD. But these bells ring and these bells sound and very few people come to those churches, to our churches. The church has lost the anointing of God. The church has lost the power of God. And this should be a wake-up call for us that we need to open up and say, God, I want to come and drink freely of you. Now, I want you to think about this because I believe that when you take and you look at the book of Acts, okay, how many of you agree that it was miraculous when you read the book of Acts? Wasn't it miraculous of all the people getting saved, the signs and wonders and the miracles happening? But here's what I want you to think about. He says, in the last days, I will take the former rain and the latter rain, and I will bring them together and cause a greater harvest, a greater outpouring than in the beginning. And this is an interesting thing that I want you to think about because what we talk about the Pentecost actually means 50 or harvest, okay? And so what I believe in these last days, God is going to do, he's going to open the windows up, he's going to begin to pour the Spirit of God out through the people, 
And it's going to be a greater harvest, a greater impact than the early book of, of, of Acts reads. Doesn't that excite you a little bit? Now, listen to what it says here in Hosea, uh, the sixth chapter, and verse 3. It says, Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come. Now, listen to what he comes. He will come like the rain, like the latter and farmer rain to earth. Now, I want you to think about that. I believe that we're setting a stage for us to experience more of God than we can ever dream. I cannot, I, I don't know how to emphasize this. If I wanted to choose a better time to live, I couldn't find a better time to live. I mean, we're living, moving into an area that God is going to do things that is going to cause wonder to spread across the world. People will be amazed at what God is doing. There'll be an awakening and a stirring that is going to shake the very foundations of this earth. And you know why? Because God is not slack concerning these promises, but he is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all come to him. Amen? And so God is going to cause a wake-up call in the church. Now, here's something that I want you to see, and, and I want you to follow along with me as we talk about what's going to happen and what should be happening in the church in year 2050. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I want to read this in the Living Bible, and I want to read verses 14 through 16. I want you to hear this in the Living Bible. It says, starting with verse 14, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the walls of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with his commandments and regulations. He made peace between the, the Jew and the Gentile by creating himself one new people from the two groups together as one body. Now listen to this. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by the means of his death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. Okay? There's a book, it's out, it's called The One New Man. Not many people have read The One New Man. Not many people know about The One New Man. All right? But what God is saying, that there is coming a day that he will bring Jew and Gentile together, and they will be one body. Now, let me give you a little history. Do you realize on the day of Pentecost that it was a Jewish church? It was Jewish believers gathered in that upper room, okay? Do you realize that through the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts, it was a Jewish church? Acts 10 is a Gentile Pentecost. What happened to the Jews in the upper room was a Jewish Pentecost. God opened the windows of heaven and poured his spirit out on 120 Jews in an upper room. Acts 10, he was sent to Cornelius' house, and Peter was told, I give you the keys of the kingdom, and it will unlock the kingdom. And so what he did, he all of a sudden turned from a Jewish church to go to a Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and said, looky there, what happened on the day of Pentecost has happened to the Gentiles. And God's Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentile church. It was opened up, and Peter had the keys, and he was the one that was sent there to unlock the door. Now, this sandwich in between this story, Acts 9, there was a mean guy named Saul. He was out to hurt anybody that thought Jesus was the Messiah. All right? He was going about persecuting. He was going about imprisoning, killing Jewish believers. God had a different story and a different thing in mind because on the road to Damascus, God knocked him off his donkey or horse, whatever he was on, okay? Drove him to the ground and began to say, why are you fighting against me? All right? So here, God was putting all this together and Paul become the apostle to the Gentiles. Isn't that neat? Acts 10, while he was preparing Paul, Acts 10, Peter, who had the keys, was sent to Cornelius' house, had to have a vision on the upper roof to say, man, I'm not going to the dirty Gentiles. God changed his tune, sent him there, and began to preach the gospel, and on the Gentiles, God opened the windows of heaven and poured out the Holy Ghost. Now, isn't that an interesting scenario? Now, you get to the end of the book of Acts, and guess what's happened? The Jewish church has faded almost out, and it's all Gentile. 
And for 2,000 years, God has been working with the Gentile nations. Now listen to this, and I want you to hear this passage of Scripture, okay? And uh, take your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 11, and then we're going to talk about this, okay? Romans chapter 11, starting with verse 25, and we're going to read verse 26. And here's how Paul starts this out. He says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinions, that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all of Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now think about this. We've had a 2,000 and some year movement of God working through the church, God working through the nations. The Jews have been rebellious and have opposed the message. But Paul says, I don't want you to be confused about this. There's a mystery that needs to be revealed and unlocked to you. The blindness that has happened to God's chosen people, the Jews, has happened until the Gentile dispensation is full. Okay. Now, here's what I want you to understand. And this is a wake-up call. We are coming down to the end of the Gentile dispensation, guys. And what will happen, God will begin to move in such a powerful way that he will begin to touch the Jewish people. And what we're seeing before our very eyes is Messianic Jews all over coming to the Messiah. All of a sudden, Messianic Jews from all over the world are recognizing and declaring that they missed it. Jesus is the Messiah. It's going to get greater, guys, because what will happen what was beginning when it was Jew and Gentile together and all of a sudden it faded the Jew out and the Gentile church reigned for 2,000 years or some odd year, God is bringing it back together and it'll be the former and the latter reign. Do you understand what I'm saying? And when that happens, they will be a greater outpouring of God's spirit than you can even begin to imagine, guys. Because you're going to see, and, and you know, how many of you have ever watched Sid Roth's? You know, Sid Roth believed that God spoke to his heart back in the late 90s and said, I'm raising you up to be an evangelist to my Jewish people. And he has shared on his program, thousands of Jews have started coming to Jesus Christ. Isn't that pretty exciting, guys? And here, it should excite you because I believe that we're sitting here, and here we've done the uh, Pentecost Sunday uh, uh, two weeks ago, okay? And the Pentecostal Sunday is a special Pentecost Sunday because something else we'll talk about, we're in the year of Jubilee, and we're in a sabbatical year, okay? And when the Feast of Trumpets sounds in September the 25th, that closes that sabbatical year. And it's a special Pentecost because, you know what? It's a year of Jubilee when God, I mean, sets the captive free, gives recovering of sight to the blind that God begins to do the miraculous, and we're sitting right here in the middle of it wondering what's going to happen, guys. So I want you to understand that here's a little message. I want you to, uh, God gave me this little message several years ago, and, and like I said, I don't preach on end times. I, I preach more on end times since I've been here at Ava and than I have in my entire ministry. But God gave me this little golden nugget about end time uh, a message, Okay. I've tucked this away. I've, I've only preached on it probably one time in my, uh, or two times maybe in my uh, uh, ministry. But how many of you realize in the book of Revelation, when the Re book of Revelation starts out, it talks about seven churches. And, and, and those seven churches, and I want you to understand something about those seven churches. Those seven churches represent the Gentile dispensation. Those seven churches represent the history of the church. And we get the history of the church in advance uh, when you read uh, the second and third chapter of the book of Revelation. But there's something happens in the progression of these seven churches. And it's kind of interesting because uh, in Revelations, the second chapter, verse 16, he's dealing with the church of Pergamos. Okay, and you know what the church of Pergamos represents? It represents the compromising church. Pergamos compromise. They tried to please everybody. They tried to be politically correct. Have you ever heard that phrase in our day and age? They tried to make everybody feel comfortable. They didn't want to offend anybody. 
And so they compromised their faith. They compromised their beliefs. Uh, they wanted to be the nice people. Where do you think our church is at today, guys? I mean, the church is so compromised. So listen to what he says in Revelations uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 16. He says, repent or else I come quickly. Repent or else I come. In other words, church, wake up. All right? Then as you progress through the seven churches, you come to the church of Philadelphia. Anybody know what Philadelphia stands for? Uh, love. Then. But also Philadelphia stands for the evangelical church. The church that was faithful, the church who was still trying to evangelize, the church who was trying to stand firm for Jesus Christ, okay? So here's what he says to the church of Philadelphia, and uh, this is Revelation 3.11. Behold, I come quickly. Hang on. That's my paraphrase. <laughs> Behold, I come quickly. Hang on. Hold on is what it says, because he says, I will not let you go through the hour of tribulation. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? The tribulation is coming on the world. I will not let you go through that tribulation. Just hold on, okay? Isn't that pretty heavy? Just hold on. But listen to what he says. Behold, I come quickly, hold on. Now, let me take you quickly down to the last church, and that's Laodicea. And uh, let me tell you how to describe Laodicea. I put this down. Laodicea is the, is the church without God. In Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hear my voice, I will come in. The church is compromised so much when they get to the Laodicea church that they've shut God out, and they don't even know he's not there. They just go through the routines. They're caught up in their abilities. They're caught up in their wealth. They're caught up in their strength. They're caught up in their numbers. They're caught up in, we got the best entertainment center in the, in the city. I mean, the, and, and if that doesn't describe a lot of the churches today, you know, they have a form of godliness, but denying the power therein, okay? But he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Let me tell you, guys, I believe Jesus Christ is standing at the door waiting for the Father to say, son, you can go and gather my church home. I've had enough. I've had enough. You know what? I, I read a book, and they said, you know, when it says the dead in Christ shall rise first and, and those who are alive shall be caught up when the sound of the trumpet and the voice of God. You know what one guy said after he wrote this book? He said, you know what the voice of God said? I've had enough. I've had enough. And I'm coming to take my people out. I've had enough of the wickedness of this world. I've had enough of the sin and chaos. I've had enough of the suffering. It's over with. And I come quickly. Isn't that good, guys? Can you imagine that little message tucked in the book of Revelation in those first two chapters saying, I'm standing at that door, and man, I'm just waiting for the Father to say, go, son. Now, I want you to think about that as I share with you because I want you to realize, what if this is the year? What if in 2015... God brings the church full circle, and the Jew and the Gentile comes together as a powerful church, as one man in Christ. What if? You know, here's my word to you. Is anybody listening? Is anybody aware of how desperate? As a matter of fact, I texted a guy yesterday. Me and him text back. I don't even like to text. <laughs> Only reason I text is because my two oldest granddaughters said, if you're going to communicate with us, Paul, you got to learn to text. And uh, so I text. But I texted with this man back and forth yesterday, several times. And finally, I told him at the end, towards the end of the text, I said, son, you need to realize we live in a high-risk time. We live in a high-risk time. Signs and wonders are around and are trying to get our attention and you need to wake up and give your heart to Jesus. You need to wake up and quit fiddle-faddling around and get right with God. That's my message, guys. You know, that fiddle-faddle, that was just an injection. Now, here's what I want you to see for sake of time. Oh, time flies by fast. Hmm? You see, listen to these scriptures, okay? Let me just read these scriptures to you. And uh, I want you to think about the word wonder for a minute, okay? And in the book of Acts... Acts 2.19, it says, I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Uh, Acts 2.22, it says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. 
Acts 2.43, then fear come upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostle. Acts 4.29 uh, and 30, and now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness that we may speak your word by stretching out uh, your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done through your name, your holy servant. Acts 5.13, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. Acts 6, 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Acts 7.36, and he brought them out, and he showed them wonders and signs. Acts 14.3, therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Acts 15, 12, then in all the multitude kept silent and listened to Paul and Barnabas declaring the many miracles and the wonders God had worked through them. Isn't that something? Can you imagine? All going through the book of Acts. Now, listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. This is all the more urgent. This is all the more urgent for you know how late it is. Time was running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer than we first believed. That's the living translation. The message is urgent. The time is closer than you imagine. And I want you to realize that as I share with you, because let's talk about wonders for a moment. Can I talk about wonders as I probably bring this quickly to a close? Because if you see in the book of Acts, wonders, Signs and wonders and miracles were happening, and that was the norm of that early New Testament church. All the way, I mean, we got to Acts 15, guys. Halfway through, there's 28 books or chapters in the book of Acts. Uh, I love, and I read the book, Acts 29. You've heard me speak over and over. It's time that we write Acts 29, guys. So listen to this. These are signs of wonders. Israel becoming a nation in 1948. 2,000 Years or more, silent, uh, Israel, Jews scattered all over the world. All of a sudden, 1948, they're recognized as a nation. Isn't that kind of amazing? Israel regaining control of Jerusalem in 1967. Now, I want you to hear something that's happened just recently that we need to be aware about that's going to create a wonder, okay? Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through three, this is the living translation. This message concerning the fate of Israel came from the Lord, all right? This message concerning the fate of Israel came from the Lord. The message is from the Lord who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundation of the earth, and formed the human spirit. I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to try to take them down. Can you imagine that? I will cause an intoxicating drink that any enemy, any nation, any power that tries to come against them, that they will be knocked down. They will be staggered and fall away. Okay? Now listen to what it goes on to say. I love this. That's the reason I use this translation. And cause them stagger, and when they send their armies to besiege or attack Jerusalem and Judea. And on that day, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. And all the nations will gather against it to try to move it, but they will only hurt themselves. Now, I want you to understand something. I don't care how much political junk you've listened to. God will never, let me emphasize that, God will never take Israel and Jerusalem out of, or Jerusalem out of Israel's hands again. And I want you to understand something that's happened. Our country has always been a supporter of Israel until the last few years. Our Supreme Court just ruled that a Jew, an Israeli, could not put Jerusalem, Israel, as their birthplace because it did not belong to Israel. I don't know whether you understand the implications of that, but if you read Zechariah and it says, when you try to do harm against Jerusalem, when you try to take Jerusalem out of the hands of God's people, beware because it says the nations were hurt. And here's an interesting thing. Our Supreme Court, why they got involved in it? Why, when we have three Jews sitting on the Supreme Court, did they even rule that away, okay? But they ruled that you could not have on your passport, you could not have on your birth certificate that it was Jerusalem, Israel, that you was a citizen of, that was your birthplace. 
that you can only put Jerusalem because the Supreme Court ruled it could be the Palestinians, it could be an Islamic state, it could be any of those things. You know, an interesting thing, guys, that every time our government is acted against Israel in some foolish way, and they've done it uh, several times here lately, we've had a catastrophe take place in America. So I'm just telling you, you, you need to think about the wonder. I think it's a miracle, it's a wonder that the nation become a, a nation in 48. It's unbelievable that when they took control of Jerusalem in 1967, there was no way in natural man's mind that Israel could have ever defeated all of the enemies that came against them. Also, you've heard me speak much about the blood moons. The uh, blood moon is September uh, the 25th of 2015, the day of the Feast of Trumpets. We've had the blood moon this year on Feast of Passover, and we've had the solar eclipse. And so if you remember me reading, it says the sun will be dark and the moon will be turned blood red before the last day of the Lord. Uh, a lot of teaching, a lot of stuff has went out about the blood moons and trying to get our attention. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. Uh, not a, Another thing, can you imagine the wonder that the Scripture says that the Jews are returning from all over the world in mass number? And what the Scripture simply says, and, and I want you to listen to this, and uh, this is in Ex uh, Ezekiel 37, 21, and to the people he said, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I will take the Israelites out of all the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from all around and bring them into their homeland. Can you imagine? Do you realize? And, and, and I've shared this with you. We've had a little a part in, in, in seeing what happened. There was a young man in, in Ducoin who uh, went to, uh, with a ministry to go to Israel because he spoke five different foreign languages. And they sent him to Israel. And you know what he was doing? He was help processing all of the Jews that were coming from all of these nations and help processing them to get established in Israel. Isn't that interesting? And so he, now you know, you know what he's doing now? They send him to one of the major countries where so many Jews are coming to help speed up the process there in that country to enable them to get into Israel. Now think about this, guy. He said, these things, these are wonders, guys, that all of a sudden, silent all these years, God is taking and gathering all of these people up. Do you realize the Iron Curtain had to be torn down? Do you realize Russia had to almost be destroyed to release all of the Russian Jews and all of the Jews that was caught behind the Iron Curtain? And yet all of that's happened in our time. Isn't that a wonder? Isn't that a wonder? You know, I mean, all of a sudden, in our lifespan, we're seeing... These things happen before our very eyes. You know, think about this. The condition of the world. How would you can describe the condition of the world right now? <laughs> Send them a fool. <laughs> How about, uh, here's what the scripture says. Matthew 24, 12, it says, And because iniquity or sin shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Can you imagine the condition of our world, guys. Can you imagine the sin that takes place? But you know, here's something else. Can I give a positive note on that? The Bible says where sin abounds, how much more will the grace of God abound? That comes back to this great harvest that I'm talking about. Where sin abounds, how much more will the grace of God abound? I mean, we're living in the signs and wonders, guys. How about, here, here's what blows my mind. My little grandson, Levi, <laughs> me, and, uh, me and Carolyn, we have trouble with technology. You ever had trouble with technology? <laughs> and and we, we've had Dish TV, and we've had nothing but nightmares with it, okay? So Levi was sitting there with us, and he looks, and he says, Paul, Paul, I don't believe there's anything wrong with your Dish. I don't think there's anything wrong with your, 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 all your connections. I think you and Grandma don't have a clue how to operate it. <laughs> I wanted to wring the little guy's neck, but he was right. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, here's the thing. The Bible says in Daniel 12, 4, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Coming to the end, it says, and, you know, can you imagine the technology 
and the knowledge and, and, and the intellectual ability that is developed in the last, in our decade, guys, or in our generation. Can you imagine? I mean, it's amazing to me. And, and uh, you know, I, I, have, I, I got the simplest phone that you could buy. I still have problems with that crazy thing. You know, and it's not a smartphone, and it's smarter than me. It, it, it amazes me, but, but you know, these are, we're seeing things so rapidly take place. And here's my last one I'll give you. Birth pains. Creation crying out for rebirth, guys. And listen to what the Scripture says. Matthew 24, 6 through 8. It says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. You know, know, there's not a thing we can do, guys, except have faith in God. Believe that he is the shelter in a storm. Believe that he is more than enough to take care of us. Can I hear an amen out of that? You can't change our president. You can't change any of our politicians. You can't, I mean, if this is set in the order that God has set it, all right? He says, don't be alarmed. These things are going to happen, okay? He says, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine and earthquakes in various places. Does that kind of describe our, our generation? And all these are the beginning of birth pains. The Lord said these birth pains would be the early warning signs of the approaching end of the age. So I have included, oh, that's, I've already read my notes now. <laughs> uh, but can you imagine? These are birth pains that are early signs of the coming. Now, let me conclude with this thing, and I want you to understand this. If the church is coming full circle, in the introduction of this message, if the Jew and the Gentile is coming back together to make the one man the one strong body of Christ, United together as Jew and Gentile, brought together. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the common denominator. Does that make sense to you? Okay. And we're coming together, and we're seeing a great harvest of Pentecost that God begins to pour out rivers of living water inside of it. How many of you realize the word for Pentecost is harvest? 3,000 souls, 5,000 souls, multitudes saved in that early New Testament church, okay? Now, we're coming full circle, and God is saying, I'm going to pour out rivers of living water to touch the multitude. Don't you think we need to get on board? Hmm? Don't you think we need to wake up and say, wow, you know, can you imagine? We could begin to see history in its reverse. And when I say history in its reverse, we could all of a sudden experience exactly what they did in Acts, the second chapter, all the way through the 28 chapters of Acts. Doesn't that excite you guys? Doesn't that create a, a little excitement, a little expectation in your hearts, you know, to say, wow, we're living in these days. We're living in the time that we could see all of these things begin to happen before our very eyes. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but it stirs something up within me. Now listen to this. The power of Pentecost is the power to witness and harvest. The power of Pentecost gave that early New Testament church ability to do the supernatural. And that supernatural was designed for one thing, and that was to touch the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. You understand that? And can you imagine? How many realize there's three ingredients that I want to close with that we need? How many realize we need boldness? Hmm? How many realize we need courage? And how many realize we need confidence? Aren't those pretty good things? We need boldness to step up and speak. Now, think about this. Ananias was a quiet little gentleman in love with God, filled with the Spirit, maybe like Charlie, going to work every day, supporting his family, trying to make a, a living. And God spoke to him, and he says, Ananias, I got a job for you. I want you to go to a street called Straight, and I want you to lay hands and witness to a man named Saul. For I have a special assignment for him, and Ananias begin to calculate in his mind. And he thought, hmm, I know that Saul. He's a mean sort of fella. He said, matter of fact, he's thrown a lot of my friends in prison. Matter of fact, he's killed a few of my friends. He had Stephen Stone, who was really used by God. I don't think I'll go. One, he loved to throw me in jail. He loved to have me whip at the whipping post. Ah, Joe over there will go. <laughs> he's always wanting to do something. You know, that didn't happen, guys. Ananias said, 
Man, I know him. But you see, God gave him a boldness to go. And no more than that, he gave him a confidence that God is sending him and God would take care of him. Amen? And he gave him the courage to even go against a persecutor. He gave him the courage to say, you can do this, Ananias. And man, it set the stage for where we're at in 2015. I wonder what God is going to say to Charlie this week. I wonder what God is going to do in our lives as we live out between now and September 25th. Can I tell you one other, just across my mind, little tidbit, and then we'll pray. I just read this. I wish they would give us more uh, news about Israel and, and, and what takes place over there. But, you know, this is the sabbatical year, and the scriptures, if you remember, talks about on the seventh year, you give the land the rest. You know, you don't plant, you don't do anything. Well, something happened this year that nobody talked about, wasn't in the papers in America, wasn't anything. You know what they did? The Israeli government gave all of the farmers money to honor the sabbatical year and not plant any crops. Did you know that? I didn't know that. First time ever. First time ever since Israel's been a nation that the government said, hey, we're going to subsidize you. We want to come back and be a nation that honors God. Pretty heavy, isn't it? Pretty heavy, isn't it? Leading in to the Feast of Tabernacles. I thought that, I don't know about you guys, but that touched my heart because all of a sudden the Israeli nation is having an awakening as well that realized that God is doing something in her. Let's stand together. As you stand with me, I want you to bow your heads and just close your eyes a moment. And as you close your eyes and, and just focus on how much God loves you, and as you meditate here with me just a few minutes, it says how much more will the Heavenly Father Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. I want you to begin to ask with me, God, I want to be about your business. I want to be in the mainstream of what you're doing. I want to be about your will. Now, I'm going to tell you what, guys. We have a little more insight. 120 were just told to wait. There was a promise coming. We've already had a glimpse of the promise. We know what God can do. So I want you, as you... Wait a few moments here with me to say, God, you know, and, and just to be honest, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little shaky about this. I'm a little nervous about it, but man, I want to experience it. Sometimes, you know, one of my favorite scriptures was the father in his honesty. He said, yes, I, Lord, yes, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, being pretty honest. And so I want you to allow God to softly touch your heart. Begin to stir this expectation up. Begin to stir the excitement of what God could do in your life, what God could do in your family, what God could do in your friends, what God could do in our community. And I want you to agree with me before we leave. God, here I am. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Well, let's pray together. Father, I love you. I stand amazed about your marvelous grace. I stand amazed about the working of your Holy Spirit. I stand amazed when I read your word and realize how awesome you are. I stand amazed when I realize that you live in me and you want to work through me. So, Father, I pray this morning for each one of us that, Father, we'll allow you to work in our lives, that we'll allow you to open our hearts up and to pour in your Holy Spirit, that you'll touch our lives, that you'll touch our family members, that you'll touch our friends, that we'll see and experience a move of your supernatural. Oh, Father, come in your power, come in your glory, come in your splendor, come into our lives and work through us. Wow. Just lift your hands towards heaven. Wow. And as you lift your hands towards heaven, just say, God, here I am. Use me. Send me, Father. Fill me, Father. Dang. Wow. Mm. Dang. Wow. Transform our lives, God. As only you can. Wow. Oh, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all day long. Let it be our story. Let it be the song of our heart, guys. Let it be the words of our mouth. And thank you for it. Amen? Amen. Hug somebody around you and say, I'm ready.